Future 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 The Future been in the media art world for a long time. Um, since the, uh, well actually since the 70s I've been uh, very uh, active. Uh, as you know I was uh, the um, founding director of the Institute for Visual Media in, at the ZKM in Karlsruhe and uh, over the years I've, I've been fortunate enough to meet a lot of people in this uh, community from all over the world. So uh, coming here to Hong Kong as Dean of the University, I was able to basically build on this network of, uh, of friendships and contacts. And uh, I'm so grateful that, uh, that so many of these people uh, have uh, sort of responded to my invitation to come here. I was brought here by Jeffrey Shaw, who is one of the world's most renowned media artists who works in immersive systems, uh, 3D, things like that. And this is the first time in my life where I've had a boss who understands exactly what I do. I can walk into his office and say something like, you know, immersive public kinetic uh, database managed uh, media experience. And he'll go, okay, yeah, I get that. Um, so you can throw any curveball and have it be understood. And he'll help you explain it to the people around you. That is a phenomenal luxury to be in that sort of environment. Uh, I feel very lucky to be at the school. And Jeffrey is bringing in some amazing artists, uh, including Hungarian Tomasz Wilitski. Uh, and that, having that environment, the new building, I think is my favorite part of the, the place so far. I've got an invitation to, to teach here uh, computer animation and media art in the School of Creative Media, which is uh, a part of uh, City University, which is one of the biggest, largest university in Hong Kong. Just recently, City University built a new building called uh, Run Run Show Creative Media Center. I think media art is definitely that strong and I think the building will make it stronger. Um, it's a, a wonderful building by the architect uh, Daniel Liebeskind and I think it's going to be a really uh, inspirational environment for uh, the students and for the faculty who are working there. Oh, 
I know nothing about Hong Kong, say. I mean, I'm just learning. Uh, but my knowledge about all the cities which I've studied and uh, I can, uh, which is uh, Tokyo and, and Paris and London and Amsterdam and Berlin. And uh, uh, this this one of the courses I teach here. It's on mapping uh, space, mind and mood of cities. My original training uh, uh, was as a film theorist. So I was really interested in philosophy. And, and in history and in you know, questions about history. So I wrote my dissertation about Taiwan cinema and spent a year in Taiwan researching the, the history of Taiwan cinema. Also did a lot of research on Hong Kong. But uh, little by little when I came here, I became more interested in issues about technology and how technology uh, influences filmmaking and film production. So I started to move away from theory and into uh, media art and art production because I, I, I began to feel that you cannot write art theory without engaging practically with the medium and the materials. And for me the main question became what's the impact of technology in film art? I'm teaching a couple of things but uh, mainly uh, creative writing but it's actually about writing and creativity so tying writing to creativity in general. I also teach Introduction to Contemporary Art and a workshop in, on experimental video. School of Creative Media teaches new medias for the students, including film, video, interactive uh, 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 art, uh, interactive application, web design, photography, such things. So the Creative Media Centre is the new home of uh, the School of Creative Media. And, uh, but it's also the home of uh, School of Computer Science and also uh, Media and Communication. So the intention is to make a real interdisciplinary hub where many different uh, uh, people and many different departments are going to be able to work together in a, in a synergi synergetic way. Well, I first came to Hong Kong in 1996 on a U.S. government grant and then um, my wife and I went back to the U.S. to my, my job there, and then at that point um, we thought, well, how can we get back here? And then the School of Creative Media sort of dropped into my lap. Um, well, not so much that, they hired me here. It has enormous symbolic value, but also uh, it has uh, fantastic uh, infrastructure, uh, technical infrastructure but also we have a big exhibition space for students and for faculty. We have also a kind of black box theatre for experimentation. So uh, I'm really looking forward to see this as a kind of hub of creative activity. Also we want to uh, engage the building socially with the people who live uh, in that neighbourhood and also uh, with people in Hong Kong at large. So we're planning lots of exhibitions, lots of uh, um, cultural events that will uh, attract people to come there. So we will have a, um, so students and faculty will have a, a, uh, an interaction with Hong Kong society as a whole. After spending six years overseas uh, in the US for my higher education, I still felt that I needed to come back to Hong Kong because I feel more entrenched. As I said, um, Artistic creation is not just about myself. It's, a bit, uh, it's about being making sense of, being able to make sense of the world. Um, and my world, to begin with, is Hong Kong. So, so Hong Kong maybe is a sense of belonging, a set of um, issues, a set of realities that I have a very rich knowledge of that I would not just take it piecemeal and turn it into a project of my own. I think media art is more international than most of the other art forms because you know just think about poetry or literature it's very very much attached to the country where it uh, 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 where it was born uh, uh, it's very much attached to the language to the actual language
I've been educated as an artist, so I did sculpture, and I worked for artists in Italy, and then it was the uh, the whole uh, gallery scene, and 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 and, and that type of thing uh, was uh, I found found too limited, and so th then we had already started in early in the 60s, mid 60s, to do things outside on the streets. Uh, multimedia didn't exist at Warta, so uh, we used cinema, expanded cinema, was so projecting on smoke, uh, inflatables. My first degree is from the Queensland Conservatorium of Music, where I studied classical piano and jazz piano. And I focused on sonology, which is the science of uh, music and sound. But, but for, for me, film, there's no barriers, musically. Originally, it was video art, and that was very experimental. I was with a group called Damaged Californians, and we did very ridiculous and stupid films in our backyard that gained tremendous respect because they were ridiculous and stupid. Um, everybody in the time, uh, the late 70s and the 80s, you probably remember, video art was very serious. It was a type of therapy for the filmmaker, like, oh, I'm so depressed, let me film myself for three hours. Your heart is the same size as your fist and serves the same purpose. Last week at a party, bachelorette number two followed me into the bathroom. I didn't see her and stood behind me as I unbuttoned my jeans, my underwear at half-mast. Her hands slid around my hips an inch down. In the mirror above the toilet, I looked like some B-movie Shiva. Keep your distance hidden in the back pocket of your jeans because I know you and the boys who litter your alley. People started asking me to push film in different directions. Uh, I, like I said, Melbourne offered me a commission to do interactivity, which turned into a wild, drunken night. It was a fabulous experience. UCLA pushed me in directions that were much more programmatic, uh, mixing softwares, um, programming code, C++, with cinema, and that was pretty much what I was doing all the way through Singapore as well. And then Hong Kong, I've started working more with going back to raw materials. So, but in a sense, most of what I'm doing right now is looking at cinema in the environment as almost a three-dimensional object, the moving image in the world relocated. My background is in film studies, um, but the School of Creative Media was founded on uh, with a different mission than any school or department that I'd been associated with. Uh, the school was, was founded to uh, take advantage of and leverage uh, convergences of media technologies and media forms and media industries. Now, of course, I see myself as an Australian but I see myself as an Australian at large, and I've always enjoyed living in, uh, in cultures which are not my own. Though I have to admit that if I, if I would talk about my, my roots, my, let's say, cultural roots or my cultural anchor, I certainly see myself located in a European tradition. Before the uh, 70s in Hong Kong, you don't have that much chance of, I mean, getting in touch with world cinema. But it's around that period that suddenly we have this kind of uh, film clubs, we have festivals, and all this contribute to our understanding. And for some of our young colleagues, they were graduated in film schools back in the States or Britain. And uh, the exposure is, is quite broad, actually. Because at, at that point, uh, uh, Hong Kong cinema is, is pretty traditional. Although there are very many examples of very solid and substantive works. But in terms of cinematics, in terms of film language, it is still pretty traditional. So we managed to, our main concern when we talk about cinema is on visualization, on the use of film language, on film style. These are more personal and altruistic kind of approach. So this is mainly our topic, our concern at that period in time. Yeah. The Prime Minister of Singapore saw my work in Europe and invited me out of UCLA. And the timing was amazing. It was uh, literally months before the housing market crashed, um, literally months before the state of California virtually went bankrupt. So um, I got called away to Asia and it 
was the right timing for the entire project. be incredible if it were coincidental, but it was very calculated and very planned by the government of Singapore. Uh, the Singapore is mimicking what other countries have done with the arts here in Asia. Uh, years ago, uh, Korea just pumped millions of dollars into the arts. And now most of the games in the world, I think 80% come out of Korea. So it led to an industry. Taiwan did the same thing. They just threw money at art and suddenly, what is it, 90% of all animation in the world comes out of Taiwan. I've been taking up uh, teaching, I mean, since 1995. In, first in Malaysia, and then since uh, 2000, I come here to, to teach. And uh, s the presence of students has played a really important uh, uh, part in my life in recent years. Uh, how they think, uh, their energy, their creativity, their open-mindedness, all these are beneficial to me as teacher. These kids are much more hip, a little bit more trendy, a little bit more in touch with uh, avant-garde culture around the world, which wasn't really the case in Singapore. The Singapore kids worked harder than any other student I've ever experienced. Those kids were incredibly focused, incredibly hardworking. The key technology that that we work with in the School of Creative Media isn't really the camera, it's the computer. Um, and insofar as cinematography and film has been digitized progressively over the past couple of decades, we do film. Um, but we do a lot of other things here too. And that was one of the, that was a key part of the learning curve for all of us who arrived in the school at the very beginning. Well, the school had the wisdom to, to realize that for all year one students, they should have a background in sound before picking up a video camera. So uh, that's quite wise, whoever initially set up the program. So I teach the year one students uh, sound basics and design, so they understand um, the basic recording, such as using a, a shotgun microphone. Um, they understand how, the hum how us as humans perceive sound. So the students should know that, because it affects everything that, that a person will do with sound, audio, or music technology. Our students do, still do a lot of screen-based work. Um, and that's the easiest stuff to, to display for, in, for the public and as, they, as they wander through, through the school. Um, uh, our students work in, in traditional moving image work. Other screen-based work is, is much more directed towards uh, application in installation-based projects with sometimes with multiple screens. Um, sometimes, increasingly, students are making works for uh, moving image works for mobile devices. If you have to explain something, it means that first you have to really understand it. And when you just use it, let's say a software tool, you don't have to understand it so deeply. You can use it intuitively or something. But when you have to explain it, you have to learn it deeply. You get ideas from understanding more fundamental concepts. And for our students, those concepts, those fundamental concepts, may come from learning the aesthetics of the cinema, those fundamentally, the, or the grammar and syntax of the cinema, for instance. Other fundamental concepts here may involve learning computer programming. All of our students, wh whether they're cinema students or 
animation students or um, intermedia students or photography students or installation art students or whatever. Everybody learns some computer programming. When we say death of cinema, we have to be careful. What kind of cinema we are talking about? You know? If we are talking about Hollywood, traditional narrative cinema, that might come to an end eventually. But even in that, I, I still doubt. Because narrative, where there are human beings, there are history. Where there's history, there's narrative. So it's, it's really what kind of, uh, how you are presenting narrative or history. That is the, the question. Disappearing, it's a heaven, but it feels just like hell, and I can tell that I'm in shopping world. They put the ping back into my shop. That is why I'm gonna die. Side. Don't know why Like a fly Bye, bye, bye I think what surprises us often is the, is the speed in which things improve or the speed in which things uh, um, happen technologically. Yeah? But the conceptual framework for uh, new media I think that, that uh, that's been in place for a long, long time. There's a lot of opportunity to take classical music out as sort of ritualistic, sort of confines of tradition into a contemporary performing art form. And I think technology has a great part to play in that. When you empower people with a musical tool that they could use and immediately make music, you can see them performing tasks that are usually only um, would be expected of musicians. For example, you know, I have this um, project called the iPhone Orchestra, and I, you know, I insist on only contacting people who, you know, who um, don't necessarily have a musical training. All the software that we use uh, on the iPhone, I insist on only using open source and uh, free softwares. I think the key is to make the musical instrument, the physical interface, intuitive enough so that they can get directly into the making of the music part. They are all actually reading off a notation when they're performing, so basically most of that one hour was spent on explaining to them how to read the notation. And once they have the confidence that they understand what I'm trying to do with the notation, then they, they start to make some musical sense out of it. In an hour, they were listening very carefully to what people do and, and they were responding in a very intuitive manner. So I think uh, it's not so much teaching, but it's a matter of empowering them. live in the future in the present. And that is that if we start to describe the future too, uh, with, in too much detail, right, now, 
that is the way the future will look. In other words, uh, I, I prefer a future which is more open, where we simply say, uh, let's see what comes, yeah? let's be open and let's be adventurous, yeah? rather than actually start to uh, uh, plot it. Um, I think it's more interesting to uh, um, be uh, adventurous in the present, to be very experimental in the present, and uh, let the future just uh, sort of um, grow from that. I think that there are many, let's say, new differences. And when I talk about new cinema or future cinema, I'm talking about a variety of new forms of cinema which don't necessarily re replace the traditional cinema that we know, but uh, add new dimensions. <clears throat> so a lot of artists are, let's say, using the cinema in uh, exhibition spaces in galleries. So you have a different relationship to the cinematic experience. You don't come into a room and sit down in a chair and watch a movie for two hours, but you uh, come into an installation space and you choose your own time to spend with the movie. For me, even um, video games, f I see that as an extension of the cinema, as, as a new, let's say, um, modality of the cinema. One of the great uh, um, impetuses for the development of new media in general is uh, to develop new strategies of dialogue with the audience. And it's not just dialogue, it's also ways in which the audience become um, directly engaged, uh, become interactive, and even take over authorship of the work. In other words, you are creating frameworks in which the creativity of the, uh, the public itself starts to play a very significant role. Another initiative that I've taken here is to uh, set up a research lab. It's called the uh, uh, Applied Laboratory for Interactive Visualization and Embodiment. Uh, I mean, for me, media art practice is also very fundamentally a, uh, a research uh, practice, a research activity. Um, I feel as if new media art is a range of uh, of research practices that have been conducted all over the world. The research lab uh, has got a lot of extraordinary uh, technology. Technologies which uh, I and my associates have developed over the years at the ZKM in Sydney. And we've been fortunate enough to be able to bring all these uh, elements together into one space um, and to uh, uh, offer this as a platform for uh, faculty, for students, for artists in residence, for researchers in residence, to be able to develop uh, new work and to conduct uh, research projects. Um, and I think one of the really uh, important challenges I think we have with the new school of creative media uh, that I want to establish is that um, research has to be part of the uh, undergraduate curriculum even from, from year one, that students should be uh, brought into a situation where discovery and innovation is uh, 
is um, uh, an essential uh, aspect of the learning process. Now, of course, uh, when we are looking at our screen, we are connected with other people over the internet. So you have, let's say, this virtual uh, community of, uh, of connectivity. But um, the lab also offers um, those types of media experiences where the screens are so big uh, that a large group of people, 10, 15, 20, 30 people, can come together in one space and have a shared media experience. So that's why one of the words in the, that we use in the name of the lab is embodiment. In other words, you have a, a strong sense of your, it's a whole body experience. It's not just eyes and screen. So when we talk about 10 years forward in the new building, look, my ambition is that the school will be a success, that the building will be a success, that this will indeed be um, a, a hive of creative activity. Now what exactly will go on there, I can't tell you. Uh, and I'd like to think it's the students themselves that actually take control of the destiny of that building and the faculty. They will, they will say what they want and they will determine what will, uh, what will be there. I think it's a very exciting time in here in Hong Kong. I mean, um, Hong Kong um, is also a, uh, you could say, an international hub. Uh, it's, a pl it's a place where people meet. It's a, cross a crossroads. And it's now especially a crossroads between East and West within respect to the uh, enormous uh, growth of, uh, of China. Um, and I think that Hong Kong will play a very important role uh, in, uh, in the development, let's say, in the future development of, uh, of uh, China, both um, culturally and politically. You know, historically, Hong Kong was just about making money. And uh, suddenly there is a, a, a really significant change in, uh, in the mindset. I think 10 years from now uh, we will see a very different Hong Kong because of this uh, enormous investment in the, uh, in, let's say, the cultural dimension and the, uh, and the uh, creative industries. The world will be enriched and the West will be enriched by these, uh, by these um, developments. European culture will be inspired and uh, if anything it will also experience a renaissance out of this uh, this dialogue Bye. 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 Bye.
Religion, I would say it's such a much stronger influence than it ever was for me in the United States. When I travel throughout Asia, I now do it by religion. Uh, if you go to um, a Catholic country like the Philippines, you know what that will be like. Uh, if you go to a Buddhist country like Thailand, uh, the Buddhists are very open and almost anything will go. You're going to find a lot of what will be considered vices elsewhere in the world will be there because Buddhists are very live and let live. Uh, the Hindus, will the country will not be as clean perhaps because Hindus believe this is all a dream and it's an illusion, so why clean? Um, if you go to the Muslim countries, uh, there won't be any drinking, there won't be any dogs, uh, but it will be very safe. So I don't even look at the countries, I almost look at the national religion of each country and it will tell you what the experience will be like when you visit it. Hong Kong is a place um, of confrontation. I don't always like Hong Kong but that makes it more interesting and more desirable for me to stay here because it is constantly uh, questioning anyone who is not pragmatic. <laughs> My mother and father who were Dutch uh, spent their entire life making sure that they would never be a burden to me and my sisters. Uh, they set up their own retirement fund uh, they were able to take care of themselves into their old age. But in Asia, a parent becomes dependent on the kids. There is no retirement fund, there's no social security, things like that. I had students in Singapore that were 22 years old that were already paying the rent and all the groceries for their parents and completely sustaining their parents. Most Hong Kong students are very heavily controlled by their families uh, for cultural reasons. Students are supposed to contribute to the family, even in their 30s and 40s. So it's a different model of you have a child, you push that kid, not only because you want the kid to be successful, but also because that's how comfortable you will be in your old age, the more successful your kid is. Sometimes I have nightmares that here are these nice Hong Kong students, uh, and their parents uh, tries to try to tell them that they should be good uh, sales salesmen or, or, or businessmen or, 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 or you know directors in big companies and then I come and, and, and tell them that look guys art is important you should be artist. Traditionally they often make a lot of decisions for the students uh, uh, which pushes the students into a very practical mindset not because the students are practical, but because the families have indoctrinated and brainwashed them into, into that direction. So a lot of them have to struggle a lot. And I respect them a lot and like them a lot for that struggle they have to go through. It's especially difficult for female students. I have encountered many cases of female students who have been unable to study because the family doesn't have enough money so they would only subsidize the male's son. I don't want to really push them to be just an independent, radical artist, you know. Our education system divides students into art and science. So usually the brighter boys go into science. It's very cultural. And some of the students who are considered less bright, less good in math, uh, go into arts and humanities. But the kind of approach I'm talking about requires breaking down that boundary. I'm getting excited talking about this, so I'm... We basically think of um, 
our undergraduate education as a kind of general education. So um, what we are putting um, on the table for them are the basics to the making of a, a new media age artist. Just like I said, they need to be able to um, use computer freely and uh, deploy the camera and be able to collect sound and understand the nature of sound and sound art, etc. freely and be able to deploy cultural issues um, through some theoretical thinking. So because of that, I think um, a lot of my students are actually very free. I'll give them tasks now, which they have to do first. And uh, then afterwards I go into uh, uh, explaining what it is. So that's why the uh, all kind of photo books of Hong Kong, and you know the city has dramatically been changing through through the time, and uh, uh, so I, I had a whole heap of these photo books and I said, okay, you choose a picture of from different times. Huh? You choose a picture of Hong Kong, and then I want you to go to this, uh, find this place again, and photograph yourself with that uh, picture with the book. So put the book, book in the context, this is by the way the Dutch photographer on Hong Kong, and say put the uh, book in the context of that time, so discover again where it is. That's one of the assignments. So another assignment was is just make a drawing and then tell you how you make the drawing, with map where you be living, where you been born and where you sleep. And so that this, this are the assignments and then I do, I reverse the system that I give you, you give them theory first and then practice, now say do practice first and from the practice then we talk about other towns, other places. I think I give them practically useful knowledge too, but still, still it's very important for me. I try to convince them that there are lots of styles which can be interesting, not just one style, not just the Pixar or not just the Disney style, but lots of styles. And I try to convince them that they will be more happy if they try to express themselves and if they try to speak about their own feelings and about their own ideas. The software industry is homogenizing creative production, making people follow certain protocols that are very precisely defined. So for me, the whole idea of art making is about saying to people, we can open this box. We don't have to follow the protocols that other people have dictated for us. So to do that, you need to learn programming. So in my own work, I always program uh, my pieces. 
I'm not a programmer at all, and I, I don't use a lot of great technology like some of my colleagues. However, I still think that uh, computational thinking is very essential, and it affects how I look at material, how I organize them, um, especially how I think um, computational thinking allows me to look at every single object of a film or a photograph or even a, a real thing to be always in the process of being merged with some, something else in a kind of new relation. I find that in my university it's very hard because many of the artists don't want to learn the technology because they don't see the technology as a medium. They see it as a tool, which is not the same. Um, and also the people in science departments um, they don't, they want to protect their domain and their boundary. And they don't like people who might be in between domains. They don't respect that kind of people who's able to connect and bridge. But for me, what's most interesting, at least what I want to do in the future, is not so much to get myself locked up in a specific domain and never to leave it, but to be a connector. To say to people, look, I have an arts background, I have a philosophy background, uh, but I can also program and do my own technology so I can connect these fields. The idea of generative art um, is that the artist doesn't create a final product so much as a framework of rules. And the execution of these rules will produce the work. So that you're less interested in an object and more interested in a system in a set of processes or procedures. And that's very useful. I teach a class on generative art, or I used to teach a class on generative art. And it, it's very useful to get students to think differently about artistic production, because they are often very product-oriented. For me, generative art is about being process and procedure-oriented. I also believe that even in commercial companies, they are more interested in such artists who makes original and interesting and brilliant and fresh things and not those ones who makes just the similar things again and again because there are millions who make the same things. I don't really care tremendously a lot uh, whether the industry likes us or not but I know we are doing good things for them. I can never be anonymous in Hong Kong. I am always the giant white guy. Uh, when I stand on the train, I can see both ends of the train, the first car and the last car. And from my point of view, all I see is sort of a monochromatic society almost. And I know how ridiculous and how much I stand out in the middle of it. So the ability to sit in a cafe and have a coffee and not look out of place would be really nice. So we face a lot of the